Bank Stroke. Uh, the following talk is titled, It's Not Safe on the Streets, Especially for Your 3DS, and it's about exploring new, a new attack surface on the 3DS, and uh, our speaker is NBA Yo. The floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, I'm NBA Yo, and today I'm going to talk about uh, 3DS hacking, and especially about uh, protocol, uh, an undocumented protocol, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna uh, see, uh, we're gonna see how I attacked uh, the protocol and uh, got uh, remote code execution on uh, the system. Uh, but before, uh, before uh, seeing uh, how I uh, did that, uh, I'd like to uh, do a quick recap of uh, the, threat, the state of 3DS hacking uh, in 2019, because uh, there have been a lot of userland exploits, uh, a lot of patched uh, kernel flows, and uh, there's a lot of documentation online about the system. Uh, and during the last few years, uh, people uh, have been uh, working on it and uh, broke the uh, hardware key scrambler, and they uh, managed to dump the boot ROMs. Uh, and as a result, uh, anyone who know how the bootroom uh, can derive all the secret keys of the system. And as a bonus, uh, they, they were able to find uh, a permanent and unpatchable bootroom exploit. So at that point, uh, you might uh, be wondering uh, what's left to do on the system. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I wondered if it would be possible to use uh, those keys uh, to attack features that were protected until then by encryption. So that's why uh, today I'm going to talk about street pass. Um, first, I'm going to uh, do a quick introduction about uh, the feature, and uh, then we'll see how I exploited it and uh, see uh, what's possible to do uh, once you get code execution. So what is TritPass? Uh, this is a local uh, and wireless communication feature. Uh, the basic idea behind TritPass was that uh, users would take their 3DS with them and uh, go out, and it, will, uh, it, it would uh, automatically communicate with uh, other, other people's systems. Uh, the point of the feature was uh, to uh, share uh, data uh, between applications, like custom levels for your games, or uh, messages, av avatars, uh, etc. So this, this is quite uh, an interesting feature for uh, players, but also for hackers. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, player point of view, so you can send your messages and uh, other people will be uh, able to uh, receive them. But uh, we'd like to, uh, from an IQ point of view, uh, we'd like to replace uh, one of those uh, systems with a PC to temper with uh, the protocol, for example. And eventually, it would be nice if we could uh, send some uh, corrupted uh, messages and see if we can get remote execution on uh, foreign systems. But for doing that, we need to know how uh, the, street, uh, the street pass feature works. Uh, so it's quite simple. It acts like a mailbox. Uh, so you have a CCD, uh, which is a system module, and uh, it's the only one that manages uh, all the street pass feature. Uh, so all your applications have uh, an inbox and uh, an associated outbox uh, in the CCD uh, file system, and they can put and get messages uh, from and to these boxes uh, via IPC. Uh, then uh, messages in these boxes are used to craft uh, packets, which are then uh, sent uh, using the street pass protocol. Uh, and we can already see on this diagram uh, which part we could try to attack. Uh, the first one you might think about uh, are uh, application passes, uh, because uh, it's very likely that you'll be able to uh, find uh, some kind of uh, game or application that have a full parser. Um, so we might take uh, and get remote code execution uh, in uh, such an application, but the most interesting one would be to uh, try to attack a CCD uh, CCD parser, uh, and uh, this would give us a remote code ex execution uh, in a system module, which would be nice. Uh, but 
for uh, doing that, uh, we need to figure out how the street pass protocol works, and uh, nobody really knows how it works. Uh, there is a, a bit of documentation online uh, about the pairing, so oh, uh, both uh, systems are saying, hey, I'm here, uh, would, like, would you like to communicate with me? Uh, but it has never been uh, successfully uh, reproduced, at least publicly. And uh, we know that it's uh, using an unknown uh, and encrypted protocol that uses uh, the uh, secret ace key that we can now uh, get. So uh, let's reverse the protocol. Uh, first, uh, well, uh, let's reverse the pairing and replicate it. Uh, so uh, it's uh, fairly easy to understand. You have uh, both uh, peers, um, the client and the master, and uh, before uh, communicating, they uh, randomize their uh, console ID and their um, MAC address. Uh, then the client uh, sends a bunch of uh, probe requests uh, with a vendor um, specific tag uh, containing a list of locations that have StreetPass activated. Uh, and then uh, eventually the master uh, receives that uh, probe request and uh, analyzes it. Uh, it checks if uh, an application from the client that has StreetPass activated uh, matches uh, one its own application with StreetPass activated. If it's the case, uh, it uh, sends a probe response to uh, the client, which will do the same. Uh, and if uh, both peers uh, agree that they can exchange data, uh, they will uh, start communicating after uh, deriving uh, a command key. So uh, replicating the pairing is not uh, super odd. Uh, if you know what tool to use, uh, I tried to uh, reproduce, reproduce uh, the pairing using a monitor mode, but uh, it's uh, really hard. Uh, because you have to deal with all uh, the acknowledgement frames, etc. So uh, I used NL802.11, uh, NL uh, which lets you uh, uh, register some specific uh, callback for some specific frames and send custom frames. Uh, and everything is handled by uh, the, your Wi-Fi adapter driver. So uh, at that point, uh, the 3DS starts sending uh, encrypted data and uh, we have to decrypt them. So uh, let's review the encryption. Uh, they do this in two passes. Uh, the first one, they use an HMAC uh, SHA-1 uh, over uh, both uh, console CIDs and uh, both MAC addresses. And the output of uh, this, uh, this pass is used as a, an input counter for an AES CTR using the uh, AES key slot, uh, we can now uh, uh, get. And the output of this uh, encryption is used as a, as a session key for uh, the communication. So uh, NL802.11 lets you register session keys, so uh, it's quite easy to uh, send and receive uh, uh, encrypted packets using it. So, um, now we can start uh, reversing the protocol. Um, let's uh, take a look at uh, the structure of packets uh, before doing any reverse engineering. So I've uh, put some packets I, I was able to receive, and the first one is one of the smallest ones you can uh, actually uh, observe. Uh, so first you have a header, uh, and then you have some data. And uh, you can uh, spot some uh, magic values here. Uh, actually, it's uh, easy to spot them because uh, CCD is using uh, really recognizable uh, magic values. It's uh, always the same byte repeated twice. Uh, and once you know the structure of the packets, uh, you can uh, figure out that there are actually uh, two protocols. Uh, the first one uh, is SPTCP. It's an, it's an equivalent of uh, TCP, but uh, for local communication, it's mainly designed uh, to ensure reliability and data, data segmentation. And then you have SPMTP, which uh, is a built over uh, SPTCP and handles uh, all the uh, exchange of structured data and uh, street pass messages. So we have two protocol, and uh, we need to review both of them. Uh, let's start with SPCCP. 
Uh, actually, there is not much to say uh, because uh, you only basically have to uh, reverse the uh, and understand the the header. Uh, you have a uh, magic value and some constants, but the most important field here is uh, the flag fields. Uh, because uh, if you can understand uh, what are the flags, you can understand the meaning of the, uh, the packets you are uh, sending and receiving. And so uh, you can basically understand the protocol. And fortunately, in this case, uh, they're using the same flags as TCP, so it was really easy to understand the protocol and how it worked. Uh, and what about uh, SPTCP security? Uh, actually, uh, it's okay. Uh, I, I did not find uh, did not find any bug, uh, but the attack surface is really small. You can basically only tamper with uh, the header, and uh, that's it. So uh, SPMTP should be much more interesting. Uh, so. Uh, Let's uh, take uh, a look at uh, the structure of SPMTP uh, packets. Because there are actually uh, two different uh, packet types. Uh, so the first one is uh, uh, info packet. Um, it's basically used uh, in the handshake. And uh, it's only here to, uh, to share information be between both peers. And then you have message box packets, uh, which are much more interesting because, because uh, they contain uh, actual uh, street pass data. And you can uh, even spot uh, the CCD message file uh, magic value, which means that uh, we actually reach uh, actual game data. And SPMTP is the last layer of encapsulation of the whole protocol. So once you figure uh, out how oh, SPMTP works, you, you you can re-implement the, the, the protocol. So let's first review info packets. There's a bunch of things sent here. Uh, many uh, fixed size data, uh, like friend codes, uh, MAC addresses, etc. But it's not much interesting when you're looking for uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and there are uh, variable size data, uh, which are much more interesting. Uh, they are sending application lists, uh, metada metadata lists, and uh, it's much more interesting because uh, when you parse them, you, you can uh, fail your uh, parser. And uh, if there is some uh, vulnerability here, we might uh, exploit them to uh, get remote execution. So let's take a look at one of those parser. Uh, this is a function uh, that passes uh, metadata lists. So uh, let's focus on the for loop. They are actually copying uh, uh, a list of uh, entries uh, to the stack. Uh, the, the destination is on the stack. And uh, they uh, do not check uh, the number of entries in the list. So uh, this is clearly a buffer overflow, but is it explorable? Uh, let's uh, illustrate this with a diagram. So uh, this is a regular copy. So you have your uh, packet buffer. Uh, and uh, you have uh, mem copy called uh, on each entry, uh, and everything is all right here. Um, but if you had uh, more entries, uh, you have uh, a bunch of entries co copied on the stack that overwrite uh, a bunch of things. But there's uh, a problem here uh, because the packet buffer is uh, not large enough to for us to uh, reach the uh, return uh, address on the stack. Uh, so we are probably copying uh, uncontrolled data. So I was like, uh, it's too bad. Uh, we can do anything with this. But let's check uh, the buffer next to our packet buffer. Maybe there are some uh, controlled data in there. And actually, uh, yes, uh, it's uh, this buffer just next to the packet buffer is dedicated to uh, a list uh, that we sent uh, just before. So uh, actually, we, we can rewrite the, uh, the return address. Uh, so oh, oh, do we exploit it now? Uh, on the 3DS, you have uh, the index bit, but there is no stack cookies or no ASLR. 
So uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can just send uh, a rock chain, uh, a small rock chain, and then uh, send uh, another one in uh, some kind of packet and uh, stack pivot to it. And then you get uh, remote execution uh, in CCD. So this one was quite easy. Uh, let's move on to uh, message box packets. Uh, message box packets are uh, packets to send a list of street pass messages for some specific applications. Uh, they are actually stored in uh, some temporary files uh, for avoiding uh, delays, and they are passed uh, once the communication is over. So uh, they are passed, so let's take a look at the parser. Uh, this is uh, the function that actually loads uh, uh, a, temp, uh, a temp file into an associated structure on the stack. And, oops, they uh, do not check the number of messages in the box. Uh, so uh, this is another buffer overflow. Um, you are... Uh, basically uh, overflowing uh, the message uh, pointers array and the message sizes array. Um, so let's uh, illustrate this with another diagram. So uh, you have on the right uh, the uh, temp file and uh, on the left uh, the stack. Um, and uh, you see that uh, you have the structure on the stack uh, that uh, we, we can see that there's the message pointers uh, with pointer pointing to your uh, temp file buffer, and you have uh, the message sizes. And if you add uh, another message in, in the temporary file, uh, you overflow uh, both arrays and start overriding some data on the stack. But um, we are a bit concerned because uh, we are writing partially or uncontrolled data on the stack. Uh, obviously, you, you cannot control um, the message pointers, and uh, you cannot totally control uh, message size because uh, you cannot put some arbitrary values in there. Uh, you'd, la you, you'd have to send uh, gigabytes of messages, and you, you cannot do that. So what can we do? Um, what what, what you, you can see here is that you can actually uh, set the last uh, message size to an arbitrary value because uh, they are checking if the current uh, message and message being passed uh, is actually inside of the uh, temporary file a buffer and if the current message pointer goes out of the buffer they break the loop without uh, returning an error so uh, what you can do is set the last message size to an arbitrary value, and then the pointer will uh, go out of the buffer, and you will write one 32-bit uh, value on the stack. But we need to know what to write. Uh, you cannot, uh, unfortunately, you cannot uh, directly uh, overwrite the return address, because remember that we are uh, writing mainly uh, uncontrolled data, uh, and reaching the return address would uh, require you to uh, overwrite the whole stack frame with uncontrolled and, uh, or partially un uh, uncontrolled data. So the only thing I was able to uh, rewrite uh, without uh, uh, crashing the system is uh, this particular um, uh, variable. Uh, it's a pointer to a critical section and it's used for synchronization and mutual uh, exclusion. And uh, you, you can see it's uh, used after the temporary file has, has been passed, so maybe we can do something with it. Uh, this is the left critical section called uh, at the end of the loop iteration, uh, and you can see that they are using uh, the pointer to uh, decrements of some kind of count, so uh, it's basically the number of threads that are uh, using the, the critical section. And we can override the log pointer. So uh, by overriding it, we can decrement uh, an arbitrary value in memory. Uh, but we need to find what to overwrite that would give us uh, more control over the memory and uh, control uh, the execution flow. 
Um, so I, I, I've been looking for something like this, and uh, I found uh, something interesting in the function that they initialize the uh, structure associated to uh, temporary uh, files. Uh, this is the, the function uh, for the, uh, the, the structure, the initialization. And um, you can spot this, uh, this uh, variable. Uh, they actually implemented some kind of allocation mode. And if it's equal to pointer mode, it will not try to free uh, the uh, pointer the pointers in uh, the message pointers uh, array. But, but if it's not pointer mode, uh, they will uh, free uh, all of them. And uh, well, this value should be pointer mode uh, in any case, but uh, we can decrement it uh, using the, the vulnerability uh, we've seen before. So uh, we can get some uh, pointer freed. And uh, since we control uh, everything, uh, at the location pointed by uh, message pointers. Uh, we can try to uh, make it free some uh, crafted and fake uh, hip chunks. Uh, but there is another problem uh, because uh, they are actually uh, uh, resetting uh, the allocation mode each time a temporary box is passed. Uh, so we have to find uh, a solution to this. And uh, what you can do is uh, try to make that function return early before the, uh, allocation, mod the allocation mode is restored. Uh, but this implies uh, making it return uh, an invalid uh, uh, return code. Um, but actually, it's not a problem because they're not checking the return code. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> So uh, what can we do so far with this? Um, so you can send a first temporary box. Uh, this will override the, uh, the lock uh, variable in the stack and uh, decrement the allocation mode. Then you can send your uh, invalid second uh, temporary box. And uh, the, pastor, the parser will uh, return early, and uh, the message pointers array uh, will not be updated. And in the end, all the pointers in that particular array will be freed. Uh, but since the message pointers array is not updated, uh, the pointer uh, in that particular array uh, are still pointing uh, to the first, uh, the first uh, temporary uh, file buffer, <coughs> which has been freed. But it's not a problem if you send uh, a second temporary box uh, with the same size. Uh, the, buffer, the buffer will be uh, relocated for that second temporary file, and we eventually free uh, pointers uh, to our controlled buffer. So what's next? We can craft some fake ip chunks. We can have the application free them. Uh, what do we do? Uh, the 3GS heap is actually uh, really insecure. You can uh, exploit the classic and safe and link uh, vulnerability, so you get uh, one arbitrary write for each uh, chunk you can free. Uh, and uh, you, you still need to uh, know what to overwrite, but uh, you can just uh, rewrite the, uh, the heap free list head pointer. Uh, so the next malloc call will return. Uh, a pointer to uh, wherever you want. And uh, you can especially put uh, a pointer to, to the stack in there. So the next malloc call will return uh, a pointer to the stack. And uh, it will be used to, uh, to, uh, to store your uh, third uh, temporary file. Uh, so uh, it's a bit uh, hard to understand. So let's uh, again illustrate this with a diagram. Uh, so first, you have your first uh, temporary uh, file loaded in memory, so on the right. Uh, it's uh, paused, and uh, the, the associated structure is, uh, is written in stack. And uh, it overwrites the, the, lock, uh, the lock pointer to make it point to the, uh, the, the alloc mode in memory. Uh, in the end, uh, leave critical section is called, so uh, uh, you have your uh, temporary buffer uh, freed and uh, your uh, location mode decremented. 
Then your second uh, temporary file is loaded in memory. Uh, the buffer uh, used for the, temp uh, the first uh, file is relocated. And the pointers in the structure still point to, uh, still point to uh, control data, and especially ORFIC chunks. Uh, so your uh, uh, second temporary file is uh, loaded uh, and passed. Uh, then uh, all the chunks are freed, and uh, the free list add is uh, moved uh, to point on the stack. And uh, finally, you can uh, see that your uh, last uh, temporary file is uh, written on the stack, so we can overwrite the return address and put a rub chain in there. So this gives us a second remote code execution of vulnerability in uh, CCD, and this one this one uh, was quite trickier. Uh, so what's next? Uh, an another one? Uh, yeah, uh, again, there, there is another vulnerability in uh, the message parser. Um, it's actually uh, an SDK function. Uh, so uh, any application that, use, uh, that uses StreetPass is vulnerable. Not only CCD, but all applications and games that use StreetPass are vulnerable to this one. But I'm uh, not going to talk about it and explain everything. Uh, it's up to you uh, to uh, exploit it. So this gives us a third remote code execution uh, in uh, CCD. And you can get code execution uh, in any application using StreetPass. And uh, this also gives us uh, a persistent backdoor in CCD because uh, CCD uh, usually uh, passes uh, all the messages in the in and out boxes uh, at startup, so uh, you can trigger the vulnerability once the the system boots. So. Uh, We've got remote code execution uh, in CCD. Uh, what can we do uh, now? Uh, actually, CCD does not have uh, much privileges. Uh, it's only a user space application, so uh, and it's pretty well sandboxed. You cannot uh, access the internet, for example, or nor the SD card. Um, so. Uh, if you want more privileges, and we want more privileges, uh, you, you need to uh, take over something else. And your, uh, your best choice uh, would be uh, trying to take over the ARM11 um, uh, uh, kernel, which is the kernel for the uh, user land processor. This, will, this would give you uh, total control over the, uh, this processor. And uh, if you want really uh, full system control, uh, you'd like to also take over the R9 security processor. So this is the processor that uh, uh, do all the uh, encryption and uh, signature stuff. Uh, and we will see this uh, later. So let's uh, first uh, try to take over the ARM11 kernel. Uh, but first, I need to uh, talk about uh, IPC and uh, especially uh, what, are, what uh, are called static buffers. Um, so uh, when you are doing IPC, uh, you need to uh, sometimes send data from a sender process uh, to uh, a receiver process. And uh, on the 3DS, you can do this uh, in multiple ways. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, if you want to send uh, large regular buffers, uh, you can map parts of the sender's uh, memory into the receivers. Uh, but you can also uh, use uh, what are called static buffers. Uh, if you want to send some small buffers, uh, the receiver can register uh, static buffers, and um, the ARM11 uh, kernel will do the copy for you uh, to that particular buffer. And sometimes you want uh, you, you need some buffers to uh, be sent to the ARM9 um, to the ARM9 processor. So uh, the ARM11 kernel need to write uh, a, need to write some pairs of physical addresses uh, and size to the static buffers because uh, the ARM9 does not have uh, a MMU, so it's uh, only using physical addresses. 
uh, and uh, the copy of data is uh, eventually done by um, process line, which is uh, the only process running on the online side. Um, so uh, let's talk about uh, vulnerability now. So uh, it's called Lazy Pixie, and it has been found by uh, Texas H. So it's not me. Um, how does the kernel handle the Pixie uh, uh, Pix? Sorry, <laughs> uh, Pxi uh, buffers case because it's uh, it's uh, it seems a bit complicated. Uh, so first, they check the alignment of the destination static buffer. They check the size of the uh, destination static buffer. That checks the permissions uh, for the source buffers. Then they uh, do uh, cache operations. Uh, they copy metadata, uh, so the physical address and the uh, size, uh, the size of the static buffer to uh, uh, to the destination. And uh, then the copy is done by the online side. But I think I, I, I think there is something missing here uh, because they do not check the permissions for the destination buffer. So uh, what you can do is uh, use an arbitrary address as a destination, and uh, so you, you can just uh, overwrite the MMU table uh, and make your kernel uh, read, write, and execute, uh, which is obviously enough to take it over. Uh, so uh, at that point, uh, the Harman uh, ARM11 3 kernel has fallen, and we have uh, the full control of that processor. Uh, but uh, we would like uh, a bit more privileges, uh, because uh, why not? Uh, we, we want uh, the full system control. Uh, so uh, let's take the road to uh, full system control and see why uh, taking over CCD was one of the best idea ever. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about safe acts. Uh, maybe some of you uh, know uh, what safe acts is uh, because it's a really old uh, um, vulnerability. Uh, it's actually a risk condition in the firmware header parsing. Uh, you, you can take over the uh, on my inside, uh, if you control the ARM11 kernel, uh, but it has been fixed in the system version uh, 9.5 uh, for the regular uh, native firmware, and remains uh, unfixed in the safe mode firmware, which is uh, basically the recovery firmware if something went wrong for your uh, console. Uh, so people have been uh, exploiting it uh, both on the native, the native firmware and uh, the. Uh, the safe mode firmware, and it has been mitigated in version 11.3 and 11.4, so uh, uh, it does not work anymore, but it has only been mitigated uh, and not patched. So uh, let's take a look at that mitigation, uh, because uh, how do they prevent us to uh, exploit that vulnerability? So uh, this uh, so-called mitigation is uh, uh, Boolean flag that has been headed uh, on the home line side, uh, and when it's set to uh, one, uh, the system just panics uh, when you try to launch the uh, the safe mode firmware. Um, so uh, th this flag is actually set to one whenever you try to launch an application. So th this was the usual way to exploit it. You were uh, launching the homebrew, menu, the homebrew menus through an application, and then uh, exploiting the ARM11 kernel, and then running safe acts. Uh, so they uh, they set the the flag to one whenever you try to launch a specific application, except some of them uh, because uh, your uh, recovery firmware needs some applications to uh, run. Uh, so this is uh, there is an exception for the home menu uh, and uh, the system modules, and guess what? Uh, we are uh, exploiting CCD, uh, which is a system module, and we are getting remote code execution in CCD. So the the flag is never set to one when we are uh, getting code executed under CCD. So uh, with an um, 11 kernel exploit, uh, you can uh, easily uh, uh, replicate the initial uh, safe acts uh, exploit. So uh, in the end, you get uh, a full control uh, remote code execution uh, without any user interaction, uh, since it's straight pass and it's uh, 
doing all uh, all this thing in uh, background and uh, on any firmware version. Uh, at the time this was developed because uh, Nintendo patched it uh, with uh, firmware version uh, even point uh, 12. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, it's time for a little demo. Um, I'm not going to do it live uh, because I, I don't want to send uh, exploits uh, in the air. Um, so uh, I have a little video. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, running my exploit on my laptop. Uh, and you can see uh, the LED is uh, turned on to see uh, that uh, the exploit is running in CCD and then you launch your uh, your kernel exploit, and uh, you can uh, launch the installer for the boot from exploit, for example. Um, thanks. So uh, no, uh, some some takeaways. Uh, well. Uh, you'd better check your return value, really, because uh, um, the second vulnerability would have been uh, really uh, really uh, hard to exploit um, uh, without uh, that uh, mistake. Uh, and uh, really, you should not hide behind cryptography, uh, because w one day your uh, encryption will be broken, and uh, this uh, might come uh, sooner uh, than you think. Uh, and uh, for this specific case, uh, th there was a, a bunch of uh, dumb uh, mistakes, uh, and basically all the vulnerabilities were uh, only buffer overflows. Uh, then uh, assessing art to reach uh, art to reach uh, features is really arduous. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time doing this. Uh, especially uh, figuring out how to replicate all the uh, the features uh, uh, parts and all all the, the different protocols involved, um, but eventually you can get some really interesting results uh, like this. Uh, then I'd say uh, please fix your flows uh, and do not implement some poor mitigations uh, like for safe acts. And uh, there's uh, uh, sting, uh, still uh, things to do on the 3DS. Uh, I, I think I was able to show this uh, today. Uh, there is, uh, this is an amazing system you can start to work on and do some practical things. Uh, and there is still uh, things to document on, uh, on the uh, open source wiki. So uh, feel free to contribute. Uh, so, uh, in the end, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, Tuxis H for uh, the lazy pixie uh, of vulnerability uh, and uh, helping me uh, getting uh, this full chain uh, uh, exploit uh, done. And uh, Edgeberg, which, uh, uh, yeah, a recurring support and uh, with a lot of things. Um, so, uh, no, if you have uh, some questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. We are very, very much on time, so uh, ask any questions, but please do, uh, do ask them at the microphone. Uh, go ahead. I thought I was going to ask a question. <laughs> no questions? Oh, the internet is humming. Great. Yes, we have two questions. Uh, the first one is, what tools and environments do you use for your research? For example, someone mentioned, how do you get all the source code? Oh, um, uh, everything on the 3S is closed source, so, uh, you have to uh, reverse engineer everything. Um, I uh, used uh, uh, IDA and Ghidra to uh, reverse the, the binaries uh, of uh, CECD. And uh, yeah, that, that's it. OK, thank you. Uh, we have a second question. She do. Is, is there any 
um, any procedure for the switch that is compatible with all what you've done. Ah, sorry, could you repeat your question? Well, um, all the things you have done, yeah. all the code, is there anything similar for the switch, for the uh, Nintendo Switch? Uh, I, I don't think there is something similar on the switch. Uh, I, 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 uh, at least uh, something that looks like uh, street pa the street pass feature, uh, but I, I don't know. Uh, I don't really know how the switch works. Uh, I've only done uh, things on the 3ds. Okay, first question for the room. Hey. <clears throat> Thanks for the talk. Great. Um, did you really need all the three uh, exploits, and which one did you use in the end for the full chain? Thanks. Uh, uh, could you repeat your question? Uh, did you need all the three exploits that you had, or could you just use the easiest one? And uh, which one did you use in the end? Um, well, uh, no, you, you do not need uh, all three exploits, uh, at least in CCD. Uh, you only need one, basically, to get remote, remote code execution. Uh, but uh, I, I found it fun to just, uh, well, uh, show all, all three exploits uh, for CCD. Next question. Um, are the street pass messages passed to the applications even when those applications are not running? So for example, when you have like Pokemon or something installed. Uh, could, could you speak louder, please? Uh, okay, are the applications parsing the messages even if they are not running? Like, is there some sort of a handler being run by the OS even if you don't have an application running, just installed? So that if you have a vulnerable application with the old SDK uh, build uh, in there, will it automatically parse uh, the corrupted message? Uh, I, uh, could you uh, reformulate your, your question? Because I, okay. I don't uh, understand. In your three exploitation uh, methods, yeah. you, ex you mentioned the third method that mentions uh, the SDK being broken. Yeah. And if you have an application built with that old SDK, yeah. uh, does it automatically parse the message even if it's not running? So that even oh. if you have a patched OS, but not patched applications, it will still get exploited. Uh, yeah, uh, the, all the applications using the, S, uh, the SDK uh, should be updated uh, to fix the vulnerability. Uh, so uh, that, um, the exploit is triggered uh, when the the, applic the application uh, passed uh, the messages, so uh, you have to run the, the application to uh, to exploit it. Uh, uh, CCD uh, uh, has been patched, so uh, there is uh, no more uh, remote code execution uh, in CCD, uh, nor a permanent backdoor in, in CCD. Uh, that uh, automatically runs uh, once the the, uh, the system is started, uh, but uh, you can probably still uh, exploit uh, games and application that use uh, the 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 whole uh, SDK. Okay, thanks. Okay. There's a question over there. Uh, yes, um, can you go back to the slide where you showed how the encryption for the packets worked? Uh, the encryption? Yes. The yeah. The encryption. Um. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, that yeah. way. So okay. my my question is, um, if all your if the only thing that you're changing is the counter and the data is constant and the keys constant. Yeah. And the and it's CTR. Then you're basically just XORing a known block with your HMAC output. So yeah. why do you even need the key here? Um. um well, uh, the counter uh, changed uh, every time uh, you uh, you start a new sweet pass communication because the uh, CIDs uh, are uh, randomized. And the MAC address is uh, the MAC addresses are also uh, randomized uh, before uh, starting a new communication. Right, but I guess what I'm asking is, uh, why yeah. do you need key slot two e 
uh, in my mind, uh, having the uh, CCD HMAC key would be enough because you can just XOR the, you know, the output of that with the final output, and that removes, the, you know, the C CTR yeah. part. And now you have the raw output of the null block encrypted with key slot 2E, which is always going to be constant. And then you can just XOR whatever output to get the final result, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not uh, super familiar with all the cryptography, uh, but maybe uh, we could talk about it. Uh, okay, yeah, let's talk off. Uh, Thank you. I, I was just putting uh, this uh, for, uh, uh, for people to uh, reproduce it uh, if they want. Okay, are there any more questions? Um, thank you so much. Thanks.